Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marci. I'm a tech lead of a team that develops Q at Google. Hello, I'm Ricardo. I'm a computer engineer at CERN. I'm extremely excited to be here again and see you all. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction on what Q is all about. Imagine that we have a scientific institution and there are three researchers, Adam, Brenda, and Chen. And they love containers, and so obviously they love Kubernetes. They want to analyze huge amount of data coming out from particle accelerators to create support or reject theories about the structure of the matter and the universe, or to make things a little bit more realistic in the light of the recent Nobel Prizes to train some new Lama model that will create and prove these theories for them. OK, so Adam, Brenda, and Chen have their ML training jobs, and they want to run them on a vanilla Kubernetes cluster. Both Adam's and uh, Brenda's jobs have 10 pods each. Chen's jobs is a little bit smaller, just two pods. Each of the pods requires a, a whole node from the cluster on the right. Uh, if they submit the job at roughly the same time, Bad things can happen. Kubernetes scheduler looks at the pods in isolation and may schedule them in a random order, like this one here. Effectively, neither Adam's nor Brenda's job may schedule completely. As many ML workloads require all pods to be up and running to start any real computations, the presented situation is problematic. And in fact, it's a deadlock. The cluster, in theory, is well utilized, but in practice, it is doing nothing. The situation will not improve without manual intervention. Obviously, it is bad for Adam, Brenda, and Chen, and they need to prevent it, this problem from reoccurring in the future. What they basically need is a component that will either admit it and schedule their workloads in full, or keep them on hold until the sufficient amount of resources is available in the cluster. There are a number of tools that can do this. There is, for example, Unicorn, there is Volcano, and there is a co-scheduling plugin. And there is a project called Q, developed by Kubernetes Working Group Batch in collaboration with Six Scheduling, Autoscaling, and Apps. What, with Q, Adams, Brenda's, and Chen workloads are, as the name suggests, queued. If there are enough resources available, the workloads from the Q can be admitted and get scheduled on the nodes, like the yellow one from Adam. As there is not enough resources uh, for the violet one, Brenda has to wait. There is, however, enough capacity for Chen. His workload gets admitted. Eventually, other workloads is completed and more resources uh, in the cluster become available, more than enough to get Brenda's job up and running and completed. In the end, the two pods from Chen's jobs complete and all three researchers are happy. Let's think bigger. Oftentimes, instead of individuals, there are teams. Teams that share one big cluster. For our case, let's assume that we have three of them, blue, red, and yellow. With Q, admins can assign resources a quota to each of them, so that uh, each of the team has kind of guarantee that they will be able to do their stuff, no matter what other teams are doing on their slices. In our example, blue team is given uh, one-fifth of the cluster, yellow team gets one-third, and the red team gets the remaining part. Uh, if any of the team runs off their capacity, some of their tasks will have to wait until uh, uh, other tasks finish. What if the red team is out on an offsite or is located in a country with a bank holiday that day or is simply doing some other cool stuff uh, on that day? No resources should be lying around unused when others are in need of them. To prevent that, Q has a concept of quota borrowing and fair sharing so that when one team doesn't use their resources, others can run their pending workloads there. And the unused capacity is fairly distributed among the teams in need. And obviously, once the red team is back from vacation, they quickly can reclaim their resources. OK, so we are at the cloud native event. What about clusters that run in the cloud and dynamically adjust their size? Let's get back to our first example. As you remember, there was a moment when Brenda's task was pending as there was no space in the cluster. In a cloud environment, Q can talk to Cluster Autoscaler and ask it via the standardized provisioning request API. Hey, 
I need to schedule this violet workload. Uh, uh, could you please check it if it fits into the cluster, and if not, organize the extra capacity for me? Cluster autoscaler, depending on the cloud, will look around, see how many extra nodes would be needed, and try to get them in full. It may take a, a while, as the most powerful GPUs are hard to obtain these days. Once it succeeds the, uh, to secure the resources in the desired quantity, Cluster Autoscaler will let Q know, and Q will admit the workload, the workload will get scheduled, and the ML training will start. Okay, so I mentioned already a couple things. Per cluster quotas, limited GPU availability, that basically means that users who want their computations completed uh, rather sooner than later may have to look for the capacity in multiple places. Okay, let's look into this use case in more details. Assume that we have uh, four Kubernetes clusters somewhere around the world. Obviously, each of them is running Q, and uh, you remember Brenda? She still wants to run her violet workload, but she doesn't know where. And the answer to that question is quite complex. In some clusters, the base quota for her team may be already depleted, but other teams may not be using theirs, so some borrowing might be possible. In some cluster, the quota may be present, but the actual execution depends on whether these GPUs that she needs are available on demand or not, and so on and so on. So, probably the best strategy for Brenda would be just to try everywhere and create her task in each of the clusters. Eventually, one of the clusters will admit her workload, then she removes the queued workload from the remaining clusters, and waits for the single, the single instance of the workload to be completed. Obviously, Brenda doesn't want to do it all manually. Ideally, she would like to have a single place where she submits the workload, like uh, another kind of management Kubernetes clusters, which obviously runs Q. She submits the task into that single cluster, then Q automatically distributes it across the worker cluster, monitors which of them admits it, removes the unnecessary copies, waits for the workload completion, and reflects the status in the management cluster so that Brenda doesn't have to look around uh, and uh, has the status of the job just where she submitted the workload. We call this feature multi queue and now Ricardo will show you what does it look like in practice and how CERN uses it in real life. Yeah, thanks. I don't need it, actually. Uh, so, thanks a lot. So, you have the really nice introduction to Q and all the amazing work has been done. What I will try to do is show you a use case where we are using this uh, functionality for multi queue at CERN. So, I'll just introduce a bit why we need this. And uh, one of the issues of working at CERN is that we are always pushed to go beyond what computing allows us. It's also one of the best things of working at CERN, of course. And I'll take one project that we recently started called Next Generation Triggers that is trying to investigate what computing technologies we need for the upgrade we're having of our current accelerators, but also the next generation detectors and, and particle accelerators. Just have an idea of the challenge. 2020 meant we had to process something like 100 petabytes a year. We know that in 2030 we'll need 10 times more and we don't know what will come in 2040. So what it's clear is that the computing technologies didn't evolve in a way that would allow us to just scale this way with the same kind of technologies. So this project has multiple areas. There's the part of the experiment trigger systems, systems which is where physicists develop systems to filter events. That's not really the area I work on. I work more on the heterogeneous computing and artificial intelligence platforms. So what we're trying to offer is a way to support new devices and also the platforms that allow these new ways of uh, dealing with, with data that people or physicists started doing. So very briefly, the demo I'll, I'll try to do is based on a use case from this project that is called Improved Particle Flow Event Reconstruction with Scalable Neural Networks for Current and Future Particle Accelerators, it, uh, Detectors. It's a very nice paper, you can check it, but basically what we want is to offer a platform where people like the ones working on this use case have this central place that Marcin mentioned, uh, which allows them to submit jobs and then don't have to care where it's uh, going to run. So it could be a cluster at CERN or a few clusters at CERN. It could be a cluster somewhere in public, public cloud providers. It could even be an HPC supercomputer somewhere around the world. 
And we want to support the batch use case that is typical for training or hyperparameter optimization with things today using Slurm or, or Q or Kubeflow, but centralize this in a sort of a Q entry point. And then the interactive workloads, which would be Jupyter Notebooks and because we are, uh, have a lot of physicists, SSH. This is the number one feature we are asked about when we develop this system. Does it support SSH? So I will go to my demo. And actually, as you do with live demos, I'm re using a real production system at CERN. So what I did is I deployed a setup where I have a couple of clusters using the same usual uh, tools we have to maintain all these things. And this cluster you see here is our master cluster, the one we submit things to. The second one is our worker cluster on premises. And the third one is a, a cluster in a public cloud provider. And then we have some add-ons we need to add. The important thing is, as Martin explained, and this is a live demo at Cloud Native, so there's some YAML to look at. There's the queue uh, description here. The important part that we care about is the queue. So we have a local queue. We don't care about that today. What we care is this multi-queues, which can be on-premises in this case. And you can see that we link it to a worker set called on-premises. And then we have an external one, which is linked to a worker set which is in the German region uh, of a pu public cloud provider. And then we have the local queues that map cluster queues and these worker sets that I just mentioned. The on-premises has a cluster at CERN. The second one, the external one, has a cluster in a remote public cloud provider. So let's jump to the demo. What I will try to do is in this first screen, in the second terminal from the top, you see our master cluster where the jobs will appear. The, sec the third one here is the, the, the on-premises cluster at CERN. And the last one is, is the one running in the cloud provider. So I will submit our first job. No, first I will show you how this looks. So this is, these are the queues that we have. These are the local queues we have, basically what I just described to you. And then we have these multi-queue clusters, these two that I mentioned before. So let's start by looking at how our job looks like. If you've used jobs, jobs have been in Kubernetes since almost the start. And it looks exactly like a job uh, would, but it has a decisional label, which is the name of our queue. In this case, the on-premises queue. We have a parallelism, so we'll launch two jobs in parallel, but we want to do six completions. And then here you will see that I kind of containerized this use case from the CMS experiment, and I kind of reduced the running time uh, it's very easily parallelizable, but just for the demo, I'll redu I reduced the, the running time. Yep. So I'll start by deploying this one. And we will see one job showing up on the, our master cluster, which is in suspended mode. The reason for that is that the actual job is not running in this cluster. What Q did was, this should be on an on-premise cluster. Do I have any? And it selected one. And we see here, in a totally different cluster, the job is already running. And we can check a, a bit the details of this job to see what actually happened. And we'll see that Q created the workload and then selected this on-premises cluster, and uh, on-premises set of clusters, and then the cluster that had capacity available. So this is really great. Uh, but one thing I would like to see is like if you have multiple jobs, like our workloads won't be one job. It will be like hundreds of jobs. So you can see here how fast this is. You saw the jobs being created in our master cluster and immediately appearing on the remote clusters. Now, what if we decide to, for example, do preemption and we have some policies that start deleting the, cluster, the jobs in our main cluster? How fast is that? Pretty fast. So you, just to have an idea, this is a very simple demo. Looks very simple, but the complexity underneath is incredible. And it really shows how far we came uh, with these technologies. Now, I will show you another one, which looks basically exactly the same, but it has an external queue defined instead of a local queue. So I'll just deploy that one. And now we'll see it running on our remote cluster. So this is running in Germany in a cluster. We don't care, like the system knows about it and did what it did, what it's supposed to be. You also see that the previous job already completed, so we got the feedback in, the, in our main cluster saying, all done. So basically, that's pretty impressive already. 
Uh, what I wanted to show you as well is one more job, which is when we need GPUs. Of course, everyone needs GPUs. So we have uh, here another queue that has GPUs. The only difference from the previous jobs is that we have this new limit with NVIDIA GPUs. So let's create it. Submit. We see it here, but we don't see a job in any of the clusters. So actually, this is normal, because if you paid attention to when I was showing you the queues, you saw that some of the queues were actually commented out. So what I will do, and Again, this is what we do daily at CERN, is just managing these things. I just want to show you how easy it became to manage the very complex infrastructure with multiple clusters across multiple administrative domains. So what I'll do, as you do with live demos at Keynote, I will commit this to production. And I will show you this screen here. This is our production system again. And we'll look at here, you see that it started synchronizing. I just committed it. It did the master one, it did the, the two, the local on-premises and the remote one. And if I look here, now we have a job running in the remote cluster with GPUs. <laughs> and that's basically the demo for today. I really wanted to show how far we came with this effort. Like, QE is actually quite a young project. Uh, but we got so far that we are running for our workloads today, and the things will be running tomorrow uh, based on fully cloud-native solution with projects like you and everyone else. So I'd like to thank Martin, all the Q team, but ev ev everyone in the community for helping us out. Thank you very much.